Here we are. Okay, ready to go. A um, couple of announcements first. Um, the first one is we don't have class next week, but don't worry, I'll keep you busy. Um, uh, because the second announcement is uh, um, either tonight or tomorrow morning there'll be another assignment out there for you. Okay, and it'll make you, of course, use the things that we've been doing here. Okay, uh, a little bit. And I'll remind you that out there on the web there are C++ classes that work. They've been out there for a long time. They've been tested out by several generations of CS175 students. They are, but they're C++ classes that work. Okay, uh, there's transform classes, vector classes, point classes, whatever. Okay, and they all work. So that if you want to uh, use transform classes, uh, some like people like to roll their own code, right? Which is not the way we typically do things anymore, but if you want to use transform classes and everything else, they're out there on the web for you to use. Okay, so uh, your choice. Um, and uh, they have all the view transforms and everything else that we've done up here also. So, uh, you know, just go out and figure out how to use them. They're not hard. Um, so no class next week. Um, Sebastian and I were going to do one lecture, but it turns out he says he's already done enough, so uh, we'll... Uh, uh, we'll <laughs> We'll uh, do that uh, next week. So no class next week. New assignment out there. Uh, you got one due tonight at 11.59.59. Okay, due tonight. And uh, um, and uh, whatever the last announcement was, I forget. Okay, uh, question. Is there a discussion today? There's no discussion today that I know. No discussion today. So the uh, um, those are the things. Now, one more reminder about the way we do things differently in this class, we don't accept assignments that don't compile, right? That don't work, right? Etc. We don't even accept them. Okay? We only start when um, when they work, and we start grading. Okay? So at 11:59:59 tonight, if it's not if it's not working, right? We're going to take 10% off per day. Now, a weekend counts a day. So you've got till right, Sunday night at 11.59.59 to get it to us for, we'll take five points off. It's a 50-point assignment. We'll take five points off. Okay? That's the way we work. Because in graphics, you've got to get it working before you even see if the picture looks any good. Okay? You've got to get it working. So uh, we don't start grading until it works. And that's, that's a difference in our class. And it, it you know... <laughs> Also, those of you who, who haven't started yet, right, who, uh, you know, <laughs> will find that this, this policy probably impacts you, right, especially the students tell me the next assignment is the hardest, okay, in this course. It'll be, it'll take more time than all of them, okay. So um, um, that's uh, the way we do things. Question. Uh, yeah, is our target machine for the compiler, are those the ones down in the CSIF lab? Or? Yeah. We, uh, those are the ones we'll grade on, and so your assignment has to work on the machines down in the CSI, CSIF lab. Okay? I don't care what machine you code it up on, et cetera, but they have to work down on those machines. Okay? That's where they'll be graded. So if you download it to that machine and we say QMake make and nothing happens, right? You're gonna, all you're going to do is you can get an email back from us saying, oops, doesn't work. Okay? And uh, you know, we'll, we'll happily take a few points off. Okay, for this, okay? Not happily, but you know. Okay? Everything alright? Now, we're almost to the point where we can really do things here because uh, we got almost all the problems solved. Um, we got the perspective done, okay? We got things in image space. We can map them onto our image plane. We can uh, just about do everything we want. Um, uh, we, did, we can do clipping now. And I'll fix up the clipping thing. I'll wave my hands a little bit at the, cl the clipping thing here in a second. We've got the clipping thing just about done. And the last thing we do have to do is figure out what things are in front of, when something's in front of something else, right, how to obscure things. Okay? And these are very well solved problems now. So let me finish this up. It won't take very long. Uh, it's a nice Friday afternoon. Okay? Here's clipping again. If you remember, we had a plane, and planes were had defined by normal vectors and points. Okay, and it, the characteristic was that for any point in the plane, in the plane, 
right? That if I take the vector between that point and P and dot it with n, I got to get zero. Okay? They've got to be perpendicular to any vector for a point in the plane. Okay? And what we did was we looked and we we decided that if any point is outside the plane, if there's any point here Q that's outside, I look at n dotted with P. Oops, Q minus P. Right? And I look at this quantity. And I can tell whether the point is on the inside of the plane, which is here. Okay? If it's greater than zero, it's, it's in. If it's less than zero, it's out. And it turns out if it's equal to zero, it's on. Okay? That was the simple cl clipping test. And all I had to do was do these dot products. Uh, you can kind of envision if you've got a million triangles running around, right? Every one of these points of these triangles has to be hit by this test, okay? Uh, this is uh, where all of a sudden graphics, and, and especially if any of you take the, the 177 course next quarter, and the, which is visualization, uh, people t undergraduate students here at UC Davis tell me that they cut, run up against big O, right, for the first time in the visualization course, that all of a sudden it's like if I don't think about how I'm implementing these algorithms, it takes forever to do, okay? Um, but, you know, so there's lots, of, there's lots of work to do here. Fortunately, we have GPUs that do most of this work, okay? The biggest problem with this, with this is that this, this, um, this dot product can take quite a while, okay? Because of n is equal to uh, um, xn, yn, zn, and p, and this is equal to some, right? x minus xp, y minus yp, c minus zp. If you, you kind of do this multiplication out, and you can say this is xn times x minus xp. You can write it out. It's not, it's not hard. yn times y minus yp. zn times z minus zp. Right? This is the quantity of the dot product that you've got to do. Okay? It's got three multiplications in it. It's got a bunch of sums and, and all. And it can take a while. And it didn't take too long for people to notice that you know, hey, um, if I could arrange it so that, say, my normal vector uh, looked like, say, um, 0, 0, 1, suppose that was my normal vector, okay? If I could arrange that, then um, I didn't have to do very much work here, okay? All I had to do is look at z minus zp and see what the sign is. Right, and all these things popped out. I didn't have to do any multiplications or anything else really fast. Okay? All I had to do was look at z minus zp. And for example, if zp happened to be like zero, right? all I had to do was look at z, right? at the sign of z, and I could do this really fast. And you started noticing that this, this is, since it has to be done for every point, right? If I could really limit the cases down to where my normal vectors were kind of really simple, then I could do this really fast. And so if you remember, we have this picture with our truncated pyramid out here. Okay. And we have this picture, which is image space. Okay, minus one to one, minus one to one, and this is the y-axis and the z-axis. As usual, the x-axis comes out the board. It's really a 3D picture. Okay, if I do the clipping over here, and here's one of my normals. Here's another normal. We usually choose these normals so that we can, we can, uh, um, so that they face in, right? So they collect all the things on the inside. Um, if we do this, then these normals are, right, they don't have, they aren't zero, zero, 001, right? And may, they may have one coordinate zero, but not. If we do it over here and we look at these normals that point in over here, okay, these normals are a lot nicer in general. And so typically what we try to do, what people do down in the GPU, is they wait as long as they can before they do clipping, and they do clipping in this space, okay? 
and you do clipping in this space. Now there's a problem with that, is that over here you get points here that are really x, y, z, right? You get these points x, y, z, and, and you can pump them through things. If you go over here, you get points x, y, z, w, okay, on the way over here. And when you get into image space, you divide by w, right, to get into image space, okay? And uh, um, the problem with this is if you divide by w, everything behind you gets flipped upside down and backwards in front of you if you divide by w. Because if you think of all those points out here on the positive z that are behind you, right, in that matrix, they end up with a negative w. And you flip them over and everything flips over in front of you, okay? So you can't do clipping over here, right, really. Uh, but it turns out you can, okay? It turns out you can. And what happens is that um, you keep things in X, Y, D, Z, W form, okay, as long as possible. And you do a first clip, right, on, uh, right, so clipping, let's do clipping in the image space. Right? The thing you do different here is you first clip on w equals zero. Okay? Now, I have to kind of wave my hands here because if you think about this, we clipped on planes, okay? And planes in 4D are kind of weird animals, okay? They're, they're, they're kind of hard to conceptualize in four dimension, these planes. But um, on W equals zero, what you do is you get, the, you, get a, uh, you get this space. If you can remember our diagram that had W equals zero here, here's the one W equal one, which is where normally we are, right? And we have this, okay, going up. If I have points down here and I clip on W equals zero, I can get rid of them, right? They can be out. And I only clip the ones that are in. And how do you clip on W equals zero? Okay. It turns out it's not that bad. Okay. All you do is you define that dot product a little more generally in 4D. Okay. You still do it less than zero and greater than zero. Now I'm waving my hands here on purpose, right? That we, if we wanted to Im actually implement this, we could clip here. But most people clip here. Okay. And the reason they do it is because it simplifies the, mo the math in the clip so much. Down at the hardware level, it simplifies the math in the clip so much. Okay? But there's a little bit of a price that you have to pay. You have to do one extra clip. Okay? Once you do the W equals zero clip, that gets everything behind you out. Then you do, w, then you do uh, X equal minus one, X equal one, Y equal minus one, Y equal one, etc., And you're finished. Go ahead. Why don't you do a clip on the, before you switch to image space on the XY plane? You can also, yeah, people also can do that, okay? You can do it over here, but typically if you do it over here, the math's all the same, right, is all. Yeah, you can do that too. But it's also the case that these two things getting here is one matrix, right? The first thing transfers you down into this configuration. That's the first part of the camera transform to transfer you down. And then the viewing tra part of the transform transforms you over here. If you do the clip here, you have to split that matrix into two pieces. Okay? Lots of times the only one to do it is one. But in any case, clipping is a nice, simple, right, easy project to do. And you're going to have to do it. Okay? You're going to have to do one part of your assignment. Uh, we use clipping in many respects. Um, let's see, the very first time I used clipping, was they wanted to do a Times Square effect around a building, so they had text that they wanted to rotate around the building. Okay? And what we did was we had polygonal text that they wanted to rotate that we could fill in with colors and everything else. And they wanted to rotate it around a building. Well, how did we do that? Well, what we did was we, we pushed this, this text string we had, we moved it down, 
until it was in the building. We chopped it off with a clipping plane, okay, threw half of threw some of it away, right, or kept some of it, right over here, kept this part, and then we rotated this part 90 degrees. Okay? And it very nicely, as it moved, as we kept moving it along, it very nicely wrapped itself around the building. Okay? As we went along. So that was the first time I ever used clipping. But clipping is something that we use quite a bit, okay? To uh, get different effects, etc. So this is clipping in image space. Um, I have run classes where we've actually where we've actually implemented this. We're not going to implement it in this class. We're going to use our GPUs. Uh, don't we have uh, more points to be converted to the image space if we do the clipping only in the image space? Do we have because, more points? Uh, if the object is bigger than the the pyramid, what we have, yeah. we have we are converting the points outside also into the image space. Yeah. Right? But since it's, you got to remember this. This is all. This is halfway through that viewing transform matrix. The viewing transform matrix takes an arbitrary camera position in space and whips us down into image space in one one step. All right. So if we do the clipping here, we have to split that transform into two pieces, where we do going down here, then clip here, then go on down. Right. So uh, if you're going to build a processor, it's much easier to do this thing of take all the points. Right transform them all down, and then do a W clip, and then do an X clip, and then an X, a negative X clip. You, do, you transform all the points down, then you do seven clips, okay, before you're done. Okay? So this is clipping in, clipping in image space. I'm, I'm kind of waving my hands here, and I'm doing it on purpose. It's the way we actually implement it on our devices. Okay, we implement it down at this step. Now the other one is depth buffers that I want to cover today. Now, when I got into, first got into computer graphics, this was the primary problem that everybody was trying to solve. How do you determine when something's in front of something else? Okay? How do you actually determine that? And take steps then to not show par partially the thing behind it. Okay? And it was, a, uh, it was a huge problem because, as you'll see, we, oh, we didn't have any memory on computers in those days. Right? And I think I already explained that the three gods of the field in the late 1970s wrote this paper where they said, here's several algorithms and here's two that will not work. And the two that won't work was ray tracing and depth buffer. Okay? And they get the, the fun thing about this paper is they got it exactly wrong. They published it in the best, the best journal in the field and everything, and they got it exactly wrong, okay? which, was, which was actually kind of fun. Um, but... Uh, um, Depth buffers are really easy to think about, okay? So when we're in image space here, we're going to project things down onto this effectively. Right? And we take a point here, x, y, and z, okay? And w's already been taken out, divided out, and everything. We've got these points x, y, z, okay? Now, fortunately, dividing by w is a really, this whole transform thing, actually, is a really nice thing it turns out it takes straight lines to straight lines, okay? Straight line in the, in the real world ends up being a straight line in image space. Actually, when we start talking about this, we really, mathematicians really worry about these things, okay? But it takes straight lines to straight lines, takes planar things to planar things, okay? It does, it does uh, some very nice, nice things for us, okay? And one of the characteristics it preserves is depth. If something's in front of another thing, right? They will be in front of right, it in image space. So we can do the depth testing in image space. Okay? That's one very nice thing about all these transforms. And the, and the thing that it preserves depth is good. It would be really bad if you transformed, if you had two things, one in front of another, and you transform them and they crossed when you got into image space. That would be really bad. Okay? It doesn't happen. Right? With the, where you have one thing in front of another. And so I can determine, right, here, here's another point, x, y, z, maybe with primes on them. I can determine whether one point's in front of another here in image space just by looking at the z coordinates. Okay? That's the nice thing about it. Just by looking at the z coordinates, I can determine if something's in front of another thing. And so um, the hardest thing is, uh, you know, what happens if you have one thing here, and one thing here, okay, 
and you have something, right, one thing in front of another, and it partially obscures, how do you actually do these figures? Draw these figures out. And in the, when people had, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen good size flatbed plotters, the, uh, the uh, oil industry still uses them. They look like big air hockey tables, okay, and they have a uh, big hockey puck on the table. They put a gigantic sheet of paper down, okay, and this, this hockey puck from magnetics underneath runs around the table and it has a set of pens in this hockey puck. And you can either tell the pen to lift up, in which it'll move to a new place, or you can tell the pen to put down, in which as it moves, it'll draw a line. Okay, it can move in very, very small steps, like a thousandth of an inch, if you like. So it can draw, if you, if you draw lots of short lines, it'll draw a nice curve and everything. And, and the oil company uses these things all the time. And it really looks like an air hockey game going on when you actually watch these great big things work, because this puck is running around the table like crazy drawing, drawing uh, these figures. But you know, in that case, you had to draw, if you had something in front of another, one of the big things is you had to draw the outlines of the figures with your pen. And to try to deter determine which, out, which outlines worked, which, which did not, was actually quite an interesting problem. And it was solved with a variant of clipping, it turns out. I would clip one polygon kind of against the lines of one polygon kind of against another, etc. But some guys at the University of Utah came up with a, even a nicer solution. Okay, They got a big $5 million or so grant uh, to do this. And what they did was they built two huge magnetic drums Okay, that basically kept depth values. And here's what happens. So suppose you have an image here, and you have a couple of these things on it that overlap. Okay. Well, what they did was they said, okay, each one of these images is made up of a bunch of, of pixels, right? Little dots that I get to color. Okay. But, right. And maybe there's a thousand by a thousand, which is a pretty good size window. Right? Maybe there's a thousand by a thousand dots, okay? And uh, so what I'm going to do here is for each one of these dots, I get to color, put in a color for one of these dots. If it's background and maybe it's black, right? If it's this thing, I, maybe I'll tell this, this thing is blue. By the way, when I get back, the first lecture is going to be color, right? And how do we do color in computer graphics? And uh, um, right now, but you can set, you can go in, you figure out how to set things to various colors, etc. It's pretty easy to do. But so they get to store color. So somewhere you had to store a color for each one of these things, okay? And um, if you lived in the 1970s and 80s, you started worrying about the fact that a thousand by a thousand is a million, okay? And you got to store a million colors. Right, and colors tend to be these red, green, blue, 24-bit things in general. And three bytes times a million is uh, a lot of memory in those days. In fact, way more than you were allowed to use, way more than your machine had. Okay, and so they had to build this special device, which they did, which had magnetic drums and everything else to keep the color values for an entire image. And then they had an automatic thing that just dumped these color values out to the screen. Okay, so all they did was store these color values on. And what they did was they said, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to store, we're going to put another piece of memory in the back, okay, of this. And for each pixel here, we're going to have a corresponding pixel in this other piece of memory, okay. And um, this memory here is going to be called, they called it a Z buffer. Today we call it a depth buffer. Okay. And it's going to go, what's go I'm going to use this as follows. Initially I'm going to put the Z buffer equal to some big negative number, right? And that this thing is very, very small, right, um, uh, numbers, right? Big negative number. And what's going to happen is as I'm calculating all these pixels here, okay? If there's a polygon that I'm calculating the pixels for, right, I'm going to I'm going to calculate the uh, depth of each one of these pixels, right? The z value that comes out of image space. Now these guys, when I'm drawing them, are in are in image space, right? And any point on a polygon here, 
Okay? I can figure out, if I know the corners of the polygon, I can figure out the z value. Okay? And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take this z value and look at back in this back thing and behind, and I'm going to look at the corresponding value for that pixel back here that I've stored. And if this z value is bigger than that one, okay, if it's bigger than that one, I'm going to color it, all right, in my color buffer. If it's not bigger than that one, I'm not going to do anything, okay? So what happened, and then what I'm going to do is, well, oh, okay, let me go back and say this one more. If it's bigger than the value that's in my z buffer, okay, initially my z buffer is set to be big negative numbers, right? So as soon as I start doing something, right, I'm going to start uh, doing this. So if it's bigger than what's in the z buffer, right, I'm going to color it, and I'm going to store the color, and I'm going to put my z value into the z buffer, right, saying, all right, I've colored me, okay? I'm in front, right? If it's not bigger than, if it's less than what's in the z buffer, I'm not going to do anything, right? It's hidden. It's a point that's hidden, right? And my z buffer gets updated if I draw this. Well, what happens is I'm drawing all these triangles, drawing all these triangles, right? Figuring out all these pixels on the triangles, which we got to do anyway, figuring them all out. And each time I'm looking at the z buffer behind. Right? Now, if you think about it, all I have to do is look at this corresponding memory location and do an if. If my z is bigger than that z, do something, right? and then store my z in that z. If my b is z is less than the z that's stored, forget about it. Right? I'm behind it. I'm behind something I can't be seen. And this is called the z buffer algorithm, or nowadays a depth buffer algorithm. Right? The reason that the Sutherland, Sproul, and Schumacher thought that it never could be used was well, think about it. You got a thousand by a thousand window, right? Well, you got to store a thousand by a thousand z values, okay? Which are floating point numbers, okay? Which are big, eight bytes maybe, right? Eight bytes times a million, it was eight million, and oh my God, we can't even think about doing that, right? We got to build a separate piece of hardware in the 70s to do that, okay? Does that uh, work with the transparent effect? Uh, the answer is yes and no, okay? The answer is yes and no, and we'll get, we'll do that later, okay? There are ways to do the transparent effect that, that have been brought up where we can integrate that into here, okay? We can integrate the transparent effect into it. But transparency is hard, okay? In general, hard. But it doesn't matter, we'll still do it, but it's hard, okay? Um, there are three, two or three things that are really hard. Two things that really come to mind that are hard. One is transparency, one is shadows. Shadows are hard, okay? Because shadows, if you think about it, uh, when you were looking at things, we're trying to process what's hidden from our eye point, right? From our camera point. We're trying to process here what's hidden from the camera point. Shadows are things that are hidden from the light source. Right? So you've got to do this two hidden thing at the same time. Right, hard. Okay, does it? We'll still do it. Okay, but but it's harder. Okay, but everybody see the concept here? The concept was so trivially easy because all you do is you keep a corresponding dot to every dot that you have to fill in on the screen, and on the corresponding dot you keep the depth, right? A z value. The z value comes from image space, and then as you're processing things, you just ask this question: Is the z value back there in the z buffer? Is it bigger than me? If so, I shouldn't be doing anything. I'm hidden, right? If it's less than me, oh, okay, I'm not hidden. Now I have to color myself, right, my dot, and I'll store my z value back there so everybody knows I'm in front now, all right? It's a really trivial algorithm. It's got one if statement, highly parallelizable, okay? Incredibly parallelizable, okay? Because all it contains is one if statement to do. And this is what on, is on every device today. In fact, you have multiple depth buffers out there, okay? Because now, to, nowadays, memory's dirt cheap, okay? And uh, in fact, many of the things we can do, we can do even bigger than the windows that we have, okay? Figured out the image is even bigger than the windows that we have, and a digital camera does this almost, right? And then we kind of average over, you know, things to actually get a really great value out. But this is one of the things that, that faced people right away was how do I do this depth stuff and it turned out to be really trivial as long as you had memory okay and really trivial as long as you had memory 
Okay. The other way to do the depth thing is to not do this whole process and to do something called ray tracing. And we'll do this in much more detail toward the end of class. Okay. And this turns out to be really kind of simple. Suppose you had a model out here that you generated, some, something out here, and you have this camera that you want to take a picture of, of this, up vector, direction vector, etc., viewing pyramid, going this way, etc. What you do is, um, through your, you can say, here's your, maybe your simulated screen, through your, from the camera point through the screen, for each pixel that you want on your screen, all the thousand by a thousand pixels on your screen, okay, um, what you do is you send out a ray into space, okay? And you see what that ray hits. Might hit lots of things as it goes out there. Okay, what you do is you take the one that's closest to you, okay? Take the one that's closest, of all the things that it hits, take the one that's closest to you, right? And use that to color that, okay? And then you trace another ray. Next one, right? Out into space, okay? Now everybody had thought of this algorithm and no one had the guts to, <laughs> to publish it. One guy tried once and was nearly laughed off the stage, I remember. Okay, because the, it's really easy to see why this is bad because if you got a thousand by a thousand screen, okay, that's a million pixels. So you've got to shoot a million rays out here. Okay, and suppose you have a thousand things out here, which actually isn't very many. Okay. Suppose you have a thousand things out here. What happens is for each one of these rays, you've got to test it against a thousand things out here to see what it hits, to figure out which one's the closest, if it hits anything. Okay? So you've got a thousand times a thousand times a thousand operations. You can easily see you've got this, okay? Which is a billion operations, okay? So now go home tonight and say on your on your laptop, say four I equal one to a billion, okay? Uh, x equals square root of 2 or something, something silly. And, the, and see how long it takes to work, okay? Even on today's machine, it'll take a little bit of time to do that, a billion operations. And when you're back in the 1970s and 80s, right, this is ludicrous. You wouldn't even think about doing that. And, and a thousand's not very many. Quite frequently, we have a million polygons out there, okay? The interesting thing about ray tracing, and, and probably the single most famous paper in the computer graphics field, is that there was a guy that realized, hey, you know, the uh, the biggest problems we have in ray tracing right now, in, in this right now is transparency, right, uh, shadows, and trans and uh, uh, um, and reflection. How do what happens when you reflect something off something else? You got a mirror in your scene. Got three things. They're the most outstanding problems. Nobody could even touch them. Okay? And this guy wrote a paper that said, oh, okay. Well, with ray tracing, it's, we don't have to just trace rays from the camera. We can trace, trace rays from anywhere. So, for example, if we have a light source out here, okay, and I hit something here, right? Suppose I hit something with this ray. If I want to find it's in shadow, all I got to do is trace, trace a ray out toward the light source, right? Collect up all the things I hit, figure out what the closest one is, and if the one that's closest is closer than the light source, I'm in shadow. Okay? And you could do that with just tracing more rays. Okay? Now, not a billion anymore. Now, no, well, three billion. Okay? <laughs> a few billion more. Okay? And then he said, oh, yeah, well, by the way, uh, you know, if this is on a surface out here and there's a normal vector, hey, I know that angle of incidence is angle of reflection. And if this object was reflective, I could trace a ray in the reflection direction, right? Same problem. Find what's out there, right? And all of a sudden, uh, well, it's okay, but you trace more rays, okay? And what's bad about this is what happens if the thing you hit's reflective? Uh oh, <laughs> right? Now you got to trace even more rays, right? Because, oh, once you get out here, you got to trace a shadow ray, right? To see if you know all of a sudden see the rays piling up, right? Same thing with translucency. If this thing happened to be translucent, there's a refractive ray that goes through it, right? And I can trace that one. And basically, in in the first two pages of his paper, he solved the three most outstanding problems 
in computer graphics in his day. Okay? It's the most famous paper probably in our field. And he solved the three outstanding problems. And basically the first two, you know, and all of us read this and saying, oh my God, why didn't we think of this? Because everybody knew, knew about this algorithm. The only problem is you got to do all the work, right? <laughs> Computers in those days took forever, right? And this says I've got to do tons of operations, okay? Absolutely tons of operations to do this. And uh, um, <laughs> it, it turned out to be, well, so what? The pictures were fabulous, right? So <laughs> almost instantaneously overnight, everybody started using, I mean, you could look at the computer, they've looked at the computer logs, and after this paper came out, all of a sudden, especially the supercomputers, the amount of t usage went way up, okay? And actually, uh, um, I remember one day that uh, they said, well, we, we, I was consulting at Lawrence Livermore Lab, and they said, well, we can't, um, we can't uh, buy another machine until we fill this one up, right? And well, you know, immediately a whole bunch of people start putting ray tracing algorithms on this machine using all this time, right? And uh, used up used up the machine. But ray tracing is the, the thing about it is it uses an immense amount of programming time. How do you cut this down? Well, it's hard. Go ahead. I have a question. I was just wondering, so all of the rays that you're tracing can be calculated uh, independently of each other, mm -hmm. fairly. So it's very highly parallelizable, yeah. So that's why the GPUs problem is, have so is, many yeah, powers. It's all, you can, they, in fact, the Japanese built a ray tracing machine in the late 1980s, early 1990s. It was a huge machine and actually handled all the rays independently. Um, it, they, it, they're in their museums. Pieces of this machine still exist in their museums. Um, but you know, it's, it, it turns out it's a blazingly simple algorithm to implement. Really easy to implement. All you have to have is a ray object intersection. If you can intersect a ray with a triangle or a ray with a polygon, intersecting with a ray with a sphere is easy, right? Just calculate the distance of the ray from the sphere and see if it's bigger than the radius. If it is, it misses. Okay, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can you can do. You just have to have those ray intersection algorithms, and then off you go. It's a really uh, um, efficient algorithm, but it can take forever. Okay, and it's really just geometric optics from physics backwards. Okay, geometric optics basically says there's there's rays coming out of the light sources here. Right, they're bouncing all around the room. Right, these rays are, and eventually some of them actually hit you in the eyeball, okay? And you collect all, all this information up and you make decisions based on this stuff, okay? That's really what it says. Well, here we're doing it backwards, right? We're tracing rays out from the eyeball, seeing what they hit, letting them bounce, right, to shadows and all, and hoping that it's the same thing. It's not, turns out, okay, it's not. But uh, it's a really nice, simple algorithm to do. Um, and uh, there are nice, simple ray tracers you can get out there. In fact, one of uh, um, we have a large Department of Energy center here at UC Davis, and one of our colleagues who was at the University of Utah um, last year started a company off the University of Utah to do a real-time ray tracer in the graphics engine. Okay, and they actually produced the prototype and everything else, and uh, um, you can actually get it off our website. And uh, um, NVIDIA came out and bought his company, right, almost immediately. And now he works for NVIDIA at a salary much, much higher than I will ever get here at the university. <laughs> but, um, um, you know, so we actually now have real-time ray tracers that can work. Uh, the NVIDIA engine is a parallel engine, right? You can do lots of things in parallel there. But it's a, it's a reasonable algorithm. And so um, the, the moral of the story is that there's two camps. Right? We're going to start in this camp. This is the OpenGL camp, DirectX camp. Okay? And um, um, we're going to start in this camp. We're going to write programs here. You're going to, all you need to do is, it's, it's so cool these days, all you need to do is turn on the depth buffer, right? which you can see it's, it's easy to figure out how to do. Just turn on the depth buffer, and automatically depth is taken care of for you. Because somehow, in order to color these polygons the color that you want, it has to go. It has to do something called scan conversion, okay? 
It has to go scan line by line by line across your screen, figuring out which polygons, right? Uh, what, you know, which, which uh, poly, where the polygons contribute to each pixel, and by in doing that, it can just keep referencing this this buffer in the background that holds the z values, and can figure out what's in front and what's not. And so, this is what we're going to be using. Uh, that's what we're going to be using. Um, most of this stuff can be implemented by turning on the Z buffer and using perspective and, and GLU perspective and GLU look at. Okay, and what Ken's been doing the last two weeks basically can be done in about three statements now. Okay, but what it means is we can fly things around and everything else. So our chief problem is going to be to figure out how to place a camera, where to place a camera, right? How to fly things around, how to rotate things around, etc. And uh, you know and make them look realistic on the screen and that's what you're going to be doing in the second assignment. Okay? And toward the end of the quarter we'll be doing ray tracing. Right? We'll do some ray tracing here. That'll be fun. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's, uh, there is, there's a lot of things done in the game industry. Uh, the game industry kind of brought back a lot of computer graphics. Um, there's uh, um, some, there's an algorithm called the painter's algorithm to figure out what's in front of something else. And the painter's algorithm says, um, basically, what we have to do is take all the, say, polygons that we have in our scene, all the objects in our scene, we have to sort them from front to back by Z. Okay? And by sorting them, right, then what we do is when we draw them, we just draw them back to front. Right? And the front things just automatically obscure the ones in the back. Right? Which is a cool idea, unless you have something that, let's see if I can draw this. Looks like this. Uh, does that do it? Yeah. Which one's in front? Oh, uh, no, something's wrong here. No, it's not right. Because this one's in front. <laughs> nah, I don't know. Can you think of three things that overlap, right, and none of them are in front? Okay? I mean, it works. There, you cannot get a nice linear sword out of a set of polygons. But it turns out you can if you're willing to clip them, right, into two pieces. Okay? You can if you're willing to clip them occasionally. And so there's an algorithm called the painter's algorithm that, that gets a linear, um, uh, basically sorts things, your polygons. And the game industry started using that because it works great on mazes. Okay? Absolutely great on mazes. You can do a really nice, quick little algorithm based on a binary tree to sort things back, back to front in mazes. Okay? And the game industry started using that. Uh, there's an algorithm to do uh, visible surface ones, kind of uh, done by a guy named John Warnock. John, John Warnock. John is the CEO, uh, started a small company called Adobe. Okay, invented something called PostScript and PDF himself, right? But he did a, a simple little algorithm like this that says, okay, I have this screen with objects in it. If it's too complex to draw right away, what I do is I split my screen into four little smaller screens, right? Sort the objects into whatever screen they intersect, right? And then I ask the same question again of each small screen, right? And then if it's too complex to draw on one of these, I split them into four again, okay? And this was a nice little algorithm that John developed, and it's called Warnock's algorithm these days. And um, it says if it's not too simple, if it's too, if it's too complex to draw, well, too complex to draw meant, uh, no, simple enough to draw means it's either got nothing in the window, that's easy enough to draw, right? Or it's got one thing in the window, that's easy enough to draw. Okay? And the rest he had case he could figure out as he went along. But the thing about this algorithm is it's parallel, parallelizable. What you do is you have one machine that's a dealer, okay? And as you split into four windows, it deals this new thing out to four separate machines, right? If they split, they deal theirs out to four other machines, right? And you just keep dealing these things out. Works great on an NVIDIA board, folks, okay? <laughs> to deal these things out. Okay, and what happens is uh, 
Um, we used to have probably four times as many machines in the CSIF downstairs. Okay. And what most people don't know was that we had it that if you didn't touch your machine for three minutes, okay, we took it over and gave it a let let our algorithm deal a uh, piece of a picture to that machine. If you came back and touched it, we canceled it and sent a message back that said no, right? <laughs> and we got we got in less than a quarter we got. 500,000 hours of computer time on some of our pictures by doing this. It's an inherent leap. And so what happened was, and the game industry also brought back this parallel algorithm too. So it's been kind of fun. The game industry has gotten, brought back some of the old algorithms that uh, we have because they can be uh, done very, very quickly. So anyway, this is my uh, lecture today. We're ready to go now. Right? Um, you're going to get finish up that assignment tonight. Um, make your political figure look really cool. Uh, Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize today. Woo! And we nice. the moon. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And we intersected the moon. Yeah. <laughs>